Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout-out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Matt, Franny, Martin, and Phyllis. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and finding out more about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive episodes and collections found nowhere else, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com, where you can support us with a one-time tip. No subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, by listener request, let's return to an interesting work of history. Moving Pictures, How They Are Made and Worked, by Frederick A. Talbot. In a new illustrated edition, first published in 1914, by William Heinemann, London, and the J.B. Lippincott Company, Philadelphia. Let's pick up right where we left off, in the middle of Chapter 2, The First Attempts to Produce Moving Pictures. Let's begin. It appears to be a sorry trick of fortune that every great invention or development should produce a bevy of claimants for the honor of being the original inventor. The word original is somewhat obscure and ambiguous, but it is employed frequently. As a matter of fact, it is a wise invention that can single out its creator. Animated photography has been no exception to the rule. Lawyers and the courts have reaped a rich harvest from protracted litigation in the effort to settle the question once and for all with the inevitable result. The law has left the matter in a more hazy condition than ever. The claim to the discovery of animated photography can scarcely be sustained by any one man. Divine devised an apparatus in 1860. Dumont formulated the first tangible scheme of chronophotography, as it is called, in 1861 which Jonas Thorpe put into practice in 1876, while a host of other experimenters contributed to the problem in some particular detail. It was not invention, for the simple reason that there was nothing to invent. It was merely evolution and the perfection of details. As we have seen, what the experimenters had to accomplish was the reduction of the length of time occupied in bringing one sensitized surface before the lens after the preceding sensitized surface had been exposed. This was a matter of mechanical detail, for the chemist accelerated the speed of the sensitized surface more and more and finally evolved the celluloid film. Various means of bringing successive sections of a sensitized surface before the lens were evolved and produced a plethora of patents, but the perfection of details does not affect the fundamental principle of animated photography. In Great Britain, 
Many investigators were energetic in the quest, but the great majority never succeeded beyond the model stage. That is to say, their apparatuses never possessed any practical value and only served to emphasize once more the truth of the well-worn axiom that there is a great gulf between the creative mind of the inventor and the commercial world with its enormous capacity for development and exploitation. Among the early British experimenters was W.F. Green, who, like others, was handicapped by having to make use of glass plates. In 1885, he displayed his first apparatus for taking and producing moving pictures, and two years later exhibited some pictures taken on glass in the window of his premises in Piccadilly. This unusual display created such interest, and the curiosity-provoked public so crowded the pavement that traffic was impeded, and the police called upon Green to remove his pictures. In France, even greater things were being accomplished. Dr. E. J. Marais took up Moybridge's work at the point where the Anglo-American abandoned it. Marais followed rather the lines laid down by the astronomical investigator Janssen, who in 1874 evolved a photographic revolver to secure records at short intervals of the transit of Venus across the sun's disk. Marais constructed a photographic gun in 1882 with which he studied the flight of birds and which worked on the principle elaborated by Janssen eight years before. The object of his quest was the analysis of motion. It will be seen, therefore, that in its very earliest stages, the value of animated photography was conceded to be rather in the field of science than that of amusement. This celebrated French experimenter realized the inestimable value of chronophotography for the study and investigation of moving bodies, the rapidity in the changes of the position or form of which was impossible to follow otherwise. Marais, however, made no effort towards synthesis or reproduction of the motion thus obtained. He did not seek projection upon a huge scale upon the screen, but regarded chronophotography rather as a means of enabling photographic results to be resolved into diagrams for examining and elucidating obscure points incidental to motion. Special apparatus was evolved and was set up at the physiological station in Paris, and some wonderful results were communicated by this industrious scientist to the French Association for the Advancement of Science at Nancy in 1886. Investigations were being carried out upon a large and advanced scale in France, while the English were merely dabbling with the idea. Marais secured records of action intermittently, from a single point of view, by the revolution of a handle, and to a pronounced degree, anticipated the present-day cinematograph. Murray's camera was successful in its details, especially considering the extreme difficulties attending the use of glass plates. He ascertained that in order to secure continuous motion, it was imperative to cut off the light from the plate at regular intervals, and he accomplished this interruption by rotating an opaque disc pierced with small radial slots which permitted the light to reach the plate only intermittently. The general design of Marais' camera is shown in figure 2. The camera of the ordinary bellows type was mounted in the upper part of a wooden frame clamped to a special support. Beneath was the handle, which rotated the shutter through gearing. 
this shutter moved at the back of the bellows, occupying the same position relatively as the focal plane shutter used in very rapid, still-life instantaneous photography. By means of this shutter, the passage of a body across the field of the lens was split up into a number of consecutive units. The interval between two successive images and the time of the exposure could be altered merely by varying the revolving speed of the shutter. As a rule, the exposures were made at the rate of 10 per second, but in some cases, the length of the exposure was only one two thousandth part of a second, with an interval of one fifth second between two consecutive pictures. Murray used a black background, and his figures were clothed in white. There was an important reason for this reversal of Moybridge's procedure. In the latter, the shutter of each camera had to be opened as the horse or other object passed the lens. In Murray's system, the sensitized surface of the plate is directed against a dead black screen, and the lens may be left open without exercising any ill effect upon the photographic plate because the latter receives no light. When a man clothed in white passed across this black surface in full sunlight, only his figure was recorded upon the sensitized surface and thus was thrown in strong relief against the black background. Special arrangements, however, had to be made to ensure the success of the result. A flat, plain, black background did not suffice, as a certain amount of light was reflected therefrom into the lens, resulting in the plate becoming fogged. The black screen employed was in reality a black cavity, known as Chevrolet's black. The cavity may be likened to a shed, the front wall of which is removed, and the whole interior blackened. In the screen used by Murray at the physiological station in Paris, the back of the shed was hung with black velvet. The floor was covered with pitch, while the sides and ceiling were treated with a dead black medium. These arrangements enabled Murray to secure more useful results than were possible to Moybridge. From the scientific point of view, they proved of incalculable value. His marvelous pictures widened our knowledge of animal motion to a remarkable extent and provided incontrovertible records of action. Professor Murray ultimately recorded the sum of his experiments in a volume, Movement, which is now regarded universally as a classic in physiological science, and even today is consulted freely for the purpose of elucidating complex and obscure phases of motion. Other investigators at about this time were General Siebert, M. L. Surrey of Geneva, and Ottomar Anschutz of Berlin. Saray succeeded in analyzing some very intricate movements, while Anschutz produced a curious wheel of life, which was called the electrical tachoscope. A special camera was evolved, whereby photographs were taken in rapid succession. From these negatives, glass transparencies similar to lantern slides were produced and mounted in sequence around the rim of a large wheel, which had to be of sufficient diameter to contain the whole series of pictures. It was mounted upon a massive iron pedestal and was revolved from the rear by means of a handle. Behind the wheel and at the highest point, which corresponded to the level of the eyes of the average person while standing, 
a small box was placed. The front of this box was open, the size of this aperture corresponding exactly to the dimensions of the transparency. It was fitted with a small electric light, a Geissler tube, in fact, through which a current was passed from a Ruhmkorff coil, and this light was switched on and off by each picture as it passed before the front of the lamp box. As each picture came into position before the aperture, a contact was established, and an impulse of electricity was discharged through the lamp. It was a mere flash, but it served to illuminate the transparency immediately in front, so that the people gazing at the wheel received a brilliant and well-defined impression of the picture, which was shown in an apparently stationary position, though in fact the wheel was revolving continuously. When the wheel was rotated with sufficient speed, the flashes occurred in such rapid sequence that, in accordance with the phenomena of visual persistence, the illusion of animation was secured. This was an extremely ingenious apparatus, but was too complicated, expensive, and elaborate to command any commercial value. It was regarded generally as a scientific toy. It was on view in London in the Strand near Chancery Lane for a little while, but failed to arouse very marked enthusiasm. However, the inventor's fiddle, as the Anschutz Takescope was popularly called, was adopted by several other inventors with certain modifications, but its application was naturally extremely limited. Comparatively speaking, only a very few pictures could be carried in the rim of the wheel, and as the traveling speed was somewhat high, in order to convey a tangible impression of continuous motion, a subject was exhausted in a few seconds. Associated with Dr. Murray in his experiments was another indefatigable spirit, Monsieur George Demony. He displayed considerable ingenuity in breaking down the peculiar difficulties associated with this work. Unfortunately, the value of Monsieur Demony's efforts have never been appreciated, but he brought his mind to bear upon the subject at a critical period, and devoted all his energies, time, and thought to the solution of complicated problems that defied contemporary experimenters. He proved an indispensable colleague to Professor Murray, which the author of Movement did not fail to acknowledge. So far as France is concerned, he rightly deserves to be regarded as the pioneer in cinematography. He not only photographed motion, but he reproduced it upon the screen and devised an ingenious camera and projector to achieve his end. Monsieur Georges Demony was forestalled in Great Britain by Messrs. Green and Evans, who produced a chronophotographic apparatus which they patented in June 1889, wherein the film was drawn intermittently before the lens for exposure. Two months previously, in April 1889, another inventor, Stern, had filed a patent also, and these constitute the first intimation at the British Patent Office of the pending developments in cinematography. Neither issued beyond the experimental and model stage, for the simple reason that they were not reliable in their operation. There was no satisfactory mechanical means for moving the sensitized surfaces forward an equal distance after each exposure, 
and this omission of an indispensable feature proved fatal to their success. Chapter 3 The Search for the Celluloid Film In the struggle towards the perfection of animated photography, the use of glass plates was a great hindrance. Investigators were hampered very seriously. They were thwarted at every turn. True, the appearance of the dry plate somewhat facilitated their efforts, but nevertheless, the inevitable glass was bulky, heavy, fragile, and awkward to handle. Finally, the number of pictures obtainable upon a single surface was limited. Realizing the restrictions incidental to this sensitized medium, the energies of many investigators were devoted to the discovery of a less bulky, lighter, and more convenient substitute. Gelatin appeared promising at first sight, but failed to give the anticipated results because it lacked stability, and when immersed in the developing solution, precipitated a variety of unexpected disasters which placed it out of court completely. The next expedient was the use of transparent paper, similar to what we call greaseproof paper, covered with the gelatine emulsion, invented by Morgan and Kidd of Richmond. When the exposures were made, the paper was opaque and resembled ordinary bromide paper the essential transparent effect being secured by an operation after development and fixing. This failed to give a clear, distinct positive, and the grain of the paper so broke up the resultant picture that this alternative was abandoned. A suggestion advocated by the Reverend W. Palmer also was attempted. The picture after development and fixing, was stripped from its opaque support and attached to a stiff sheet of insoluble gelatine. This gave a somewhat better effect, but it was a roundabout method, and the stripping operation was one of great delicacy, involving extreme care and uncertain in its results. The substitutes failing one after another, the hopes of the experimenters became centered upon celluloid, which from every point of view appeared the most suitable medium. The application of celluloid to photographic purposes had been advocated many years previously, but there were many obstacles of a technical character which prevented its use at the time. The investigator, however, continued the struggle towards bringing the celluloid film into the realm of practicability. He was baffled in one particular direction. Celluloid could not be employed with the collodion process, for the collodion which constituted the sensitive surface in the old wet process with glass plates, and which in itself is a solution of pyroxylene, a kind of gun cotton, one of the basic constituents of celluloid, dissolved the celluloid which was coated with it. The perfection of the gelatino-bromide process removed this defect. Then another difficulty loomed up. Celluloid at that time was not made in sheets sufficiently thin to render it applicable to photography, and the manufacturers of the commodity could not be prevailed upon to prepare the substance in this form. They argued that there was no promise of a sufficiently remunerative market to warrant the design of special machinery for the manufacture of such a product. Consequently, the experimenters were forced to prepare their own film bases. 
the experiences of those who grappled with this question and faced trials and tribulations innumerable in this particular phase of operations make interesting reading. One reduced the celluloid to a liquid consistency and poured the plastic mass over large glass plates, rolling it out to form a thin skin. The surface of the glass previously was cleaned carefully to prevent the mixture adhering thereto. The pouring had to be carefully done so as to secure an even thickness and to avoid the formation of air bubbles. In this way, a thin sheet was secured, a decided forward step. In the dark room, this base, as it is called, had next to be covered with a thin layer of sensitized emulsion, and the whole left to dry. Afterwards, the sheet was cut into strips of the width required for the camera and apparatus. Unfortunately, in drying, the celluloid was found to play many sorry tricks. It buckled, twisted, and shrank into strange contortions, and the films thus produced were still somewhat too substantial, being, in fact, very similar to those used in the pack film camera of today. Another worker was more fortunate. By dint of importunity, he succeeded in inducing one manufacturing firm to produce sheets of celluloid no thicker than drawing paper for his experiments. But when the sheets were delivered, they were far from being satisfactory being deficient in uniformity of thickness. Before the surface could be coated with sensitized emulsion, a tedious task had to be performed. The inequalities had to be scraped and pared off, and finally the whole sheet had to be made thinner by being rubbed down with emery cloth and sandpaper. Hours were occupied in this process, and often a maddening accident happened in the final stages, which irreparably injured the sheet, and wasted not only time, but costly material. Even when sensitizing was carried out successfully, it was found extremely difficult to keep the material flat. It is not surprising that after a prolonged experience of these disadvantages, this particular investigator abandoned his experiments for a time. In the majority of these efforts, the pictures obtained were about four inches in width by three inches deep, while the modern cinematograph film is only one three-eighths of an inch in width by three-quarters of an inch deep and almost as thin as a shaving. The celluloid made at that time was not very transparent, and as the pictures were somewhat dense, the results were far from being satisfactory. It began to look as though celluloid were doomed to follow in the wake of the other expedients that had been tested and found wanting. Such would have been the case, but for the indefatigable efforts of one man who persevered with his experiments in the face of heart-rending failures and disappointing results. This was Mr. Eastman of Rochester, in the state of New York, who worked in conjunction with Mr. Walker. These two gentlemen had established a dry photographic plate manufacturing process, which had developed into a conspicuous success and became known as the Eastman Dry Plate Company, now familiar as the Eastman Kodak Company. The story of their innumerable experiments and ultimate success constitutes a fascinating chapter in the story of animated photography. As early as 1884, Mr. Eastman realized that a substitute for glass was in demand to facilitate ordinary photography. 
Accordingly, he set out to discover a system of photographing on films. As he admits himself, it was by no means a new idea. From time to time, spasmodic attempts in the same direction had been made by enterprising inventors, the earliest known dating back as far as 1854, a year or two before the invention of Parkesine, now known as celluloid, by Mr. A. Parks of Birmingham. All of these experimenters, however, had been baffled by the technical difficulties confronting their quest, and Mr. Eastman had no tangible assistance to aid him in his work of research. He was compelled to create the foundation upon which to carry out his developments and to reap success from mortifying failures. In 1884, when Messrs. Eastman and Walker commenced operations, the problem to be solved in the production of a suitable film and the evolution of the means to handle it in the camera were formidable obstacles. The mechanical part of the work proved the easier, and in 1885, roller photography, which has revolutionized the art of photography, at any rate from the amateur point of view, was invented and put on the market. This principle is now well known. A length of film wound upon one roller is passed behind the lens in sections for exposure, and then rolled up on a second roller until the hole has been exposed. The device simplified the process very appreciably, and it may fairly be accused of being the parent of the modern Kodak Fiend. Though the mechanical part of the problem had thus been solved successfully, the film question was perfected only partially at this time. The film itself was far from satisfactory, but it sufficed to meet the requirements of the day and to enable roller photography to come into vogue. To meet the peculiar demands of roller photography, Mr. Eastman had set himself the task of producing a transparent base or support for the sensitized emulsion. That is to say, he sought and produced a stable substitute for the glass plate upon which the sensitized emulsion to record the image could be mounted. It was no easy search, as he speedily found to his cost for it involved scores of experiments, one after the other, all of which resulted in heart-rending failure. He sought to build up such a base as he had in mind by means of successive layers of collodion and rubber, but the result did not possess sufficient substance and strength. Then he had a recourse to paper, which he used merely as a temporary support. The roll of paper was first coated with soluble gelatine, and afterwards with the sensitized emulsion, which was rendered insoluble in itself by the addition of chrome alum. This produced a substantial film, which was exposed by means of the roll holder attached to the ordinary camera. The image was developed and fixed. Then, still attached to the paper, the film was placed while wet, immediately after washing, upon a piece of glass coated with a thin solution of rubber. As soon as the surface had dried, hot water was applied to the paper, which as the gelatine dissolved became detached leaving the film adhering to the surface of the rubber-coated glass. In place of the paper, a moistened thin sheet of gelatine was substituted. When the hole had dried thoroughly, it was detached from the glass, and the result was a perfectly transparent negative. The process was necessarily somewhat intricate and occupied some time, but the results obtained 
were sufficiently practicable to render it commercially exploitable. Mr. Eastman, however, soon recognized the fact that the trouble of transferring the image from the temporary paper base to the gelatine support decreased the practical value of the process. He decided to dispense with the paper support entirely, and in his search for a suitable substitute, his thoughts turned towards celluloid. He communicated with the various manufacturers of that material, but not one was prepared to supply him with the substance in sheets of sufficient size and thinness. Consequently, he was compelled to devise ways and means to supply the deficiency, and this was achieved partially by accident. In the early part of 1889, some experiments were being made to discover a varnish to take the place of the gelatin sheets. One of his chemists drew Mr. Eastman's attention to a thick solution of gun cotton in wood alcohol. It was tested to prove its suitability to take the place of the gelatin, but was found wanting in practical efficiency. However, Mr. Eastman recognized the solution as one which might prove to be the film base for which he had been searching. He had had such a medium in mind when engaged in his first experiments in 1884, which resulted in the production of the stripping film. He decided to utilize this solution of gun cotton in wood alcohol and to fashion it into the foundation for the sensitized emulsion so that stripping and other troublesome operations of a like nature might be avoided. He was moved to this experiment because this solution could be made almost as transparent practically as glass. Accordingly, he set to work to devise a machine to prepare thin sheets such as he required from this mixture. Success crowned his efforts, and in 1889, the first long strip of celluloid film suited to cinematograph work appeared in the United States. Messrs. Eastman and Walker had not been alone in their quest. In England, experiments were being carried out in the same field. Curiously enough, the main idea in this instance was to evolve a form of roller photography, the British experimenter being Mr. Blair. He likewise met with success, and the film was manufactured at St. Mary Cray in Kent. Though this film was far from being perfect, showing considerable variation in thickness, it served to assist the experiments in animated photography to a marked degree. The celluloid strip thus produced was about twice the width of that now used in cinematography, and as in the early attempts towards moving pictures, no effort was being made towards projection. The illusion was received by looking into an instrument through which the film traveled and behind which a light was placed. It was made with a matte surface, so that it closely resembled ground glass, upon which the images stood out distinctly and brilliantly. The width of the film was gradually decreased, but this film manufacturing industry never got a firm foothold in England. The Blair Company was merged in that of the Eastman Company in America, and it was not until many years had passed that another bid for participation in the manufacture of celluloid film for moving picture purposes was made by a British firm. So soon as it leaked out in America in 1889 that Mr. Eastman had succeeded in his difficult search, and that a film with a transparent, rigid support, which was no more difficult to handle than a glass plate, and yet, which was flexible and free from fragility, 
was commercially available, another experimenter appeared on the scene. He had been laboring in the field for some years, but realizing the futility of glass plates, had postponed his investigations until such time that a substitute could be obtained. His apparatus was ready, but the film was the missing link. Immediately as it was available, he secured some of the material and completed his apparatus. That man was Thomas Alva Edison, and his kinetoscope was the first commercial appliance to show pictures in natural movement. Animated photography was lifted from the realm of experiment into that of commercial practicability. And with the conclusion of Chapter 3 and that hint of greatness to come, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Moving Pictures, How They Are Made and Worked, which so far has been surprisingly interesting. I hope you're enjoying this as well. If you'd like to read this work for yourself and see the many photographic illustrations, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, as one of your fellow listeners did with this book, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>